Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know already that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a very interesting one. It's a series that we'll be studying, or we are studying from July through September of 2014, entitled The Teachings of Jesus. And this particular lesson is lesson number three in that series, on the Holy Spirit. And I'll bet you guessed that the first lesson was on the Father and the second one was about the Son. Well, now we're ready for the Holy Spirit. This is the lesson for July 19 of 2014. And we hope that you have your Bible handy. I'm going to say a few words that you, so when you'll be, have a chance to grab that Bible. And then let's pray together as we talk about this very important subject. Our kind and wonderful Father, we don't give the Holy Spirit probably the respect he needs. Help us in this lesson as we study the many things that he has done and that he will do and he promises to do for us. Help us to draw closer to him, to understand more clearly what he can do for us and have a better relationship with him is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. What's the work of the Holy Spirit? Do we understand his work? There's a very interesting two, three paragraphs at the beginning of our handout from the, the Bible study guide from the General Conference that I thought we should, we should look at. Of the three persons of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit is the least understood. It is ironic that the person who is closest to us, the being who produces the new birth in us, the being who, uh, I'm sorry, who dwells in us and transforms us is the one we know so little about. Why, to begin with, the Bible is less explicit regarding the Holy Spirit than it is about the Father and the Son. There are many references to the Spirit in Scripture, but most are metaphoric or symbolic. The Bible gives us ample information about the work of the Spirit, but it says little about His nature. Another reason arises from the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He is constantly trying to focus our attention on Christ, not on His own person. In the plan of salvation, the Spirit plays a subordinate role, or a subordinated role, serving the Father and the Son, although this function does not imply inferiority in essence. And that, of course, is the study for Sabbath, July 12. But we know, if you remember anything about John 13, 14, 15, and 16, that Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit when he left this earth. So what's the Holy Spirit supposed to do for us? Have you ever wished that you could spend some time with Jesus? Well, you can spend time with the Holy Spirit. Would that be any different than spending time with Jesus? How about with the Bible? Isn't that the yeah. way the Holy Spirit communicates to us? Yeah, what about that? Quiet, quietly behind the scenes, not overbearing. Mm -hmm. um, Does the Holy Spirit at. gently water us like uh, God's flowers in a garden. Yes. And so the Holy Spirit makes each one of us bloom into whatever we are, a tulip, a rose, or whatever, very well, quietly. Yeah. That's assuming, of course, we, we, we welcome him in. And that's the big problem, because not many people are really willing to welcome him in. I don't recall that uh, Martin Luther was all necessarily all that calm and gentle, was the Yes. Was the, mo the, uh, the Holy Spirit motivating him? Well, we some of so. us are cactus. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, just mentioning that the Holy Spirit is kind of calm and sedate and yeah. gentle, is, it, is that really, is that really completely the way it is? Well, when he helped to create our world, was that calm and sedate? I thought Jesus did that. When he, when, when he, was, the, he was the wind that blew over the waters? That's not very... I, I think I more meant the Holy Spirit does his work without fanfare. Yeah. Like if you're in a place of employment and there's a steady worker that is helping the success of the company, never gets recognized, is always there, always doing, and when they go away, they are terribly missed. And you don't even know at the time, you don't even appreciate him. And I, I think that is what I meant, the Holy Spirit um, is, uh, 
the Holy Spirit's light goes on Jesus and on God and on growing you and mm -hmm. never on the Holy Spirit. Well, Jesus said some very important things about the Holy Spirit. Let's look at some of them. John 14, 16 to 18. I will ask the Father, now this is in the upper room, the night before he was crucified, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper who will stay with you forever. He's the Spirit who reveals the truth about God. And I want to pay a special attention to that. What is the work of the Holy Spirit? Reveal. Reveal the truth about God. We're going to see that again and again and again. The world cannot receive him because it cannot see him or know him. But you know him because he remains with you and is in you. Oh, I thought that's what Jesus came to do. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So, that's right. So what more is there to be revealed? Well, but Jesus isn't here anymore. You can't see him. So when he left, he says, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving you the Holy Spirit. right here. Yeah, I can well, see this. I can't see the Holy Spirit. I can't see Jesus. The Holy Spirit works through that. That's exactly the, one of the main ways he works. Look I at have, this. I have a question. Yeah. It said forever. The Holy Spirit will be with you forever. Does that mean the Holy Spirit is going to be with us in heaven? Absolutely. So the Holy Spirit will be continuing to teach us about God in heaven? Oh, absolutely. And I would ask you this question. There was, I'm not the first one to think about this question, but um, something to think about on this uh, while we're talking together. Maybe we'll come back to it at the end. Do you think in heaven you'll be able to go up to the Holy Spirit and give him a hug? Got to get there to find out. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first part of the, the puzzle, right? Get there first. Well, Jesus goes on to say in Matthew 15, 26, the helper will come, of course, talking about the Spirit, who reveals the truth about God who comes from the Father. I will send him to you from the Father, and he will speak about me. Okay, so what's he coming to talk about? The Father. Well, oh. Jesus said me, didn't he? Oh, Jesus. He's supposed to also talk to us about Jesus. Okay, so if, God, if the primary work of the Holy Spirit is to speak about God, what do you suppose he wants us to do? The same. Learn I mean, about God. Shouldn't we learn about God and then we, shouldn't we be prepared to speak about God? Or act like God. Well, that would be great, wouldn't it? Well, the word that's often used for the Holy Spirit in the, in the New Testament is the Greek word parakletos. It means something, someone who is called to assist a person who needs help. Now, back in its very beginnings, this was a word about a group of people who stood behind the phalanx of the, of the Greek soldiers as they were fighting battles. And if someone was down and they needed help, these guys would rush up behind, from behind and help out the person who was in, was in trouble. So that's what a parakletos does, okay? Today, it is, is it a little button you push and you say, help, I can't get up, I've fallen down, and they send you help? Well, that would be nice, but no, it doesn't work quite like that. Probably more like a modern day word, close and not the same would be coach. Yeah, something like that, yeah. Helper, Assistant, a uh, helper, yeah. Well, look at 1 John 2, verse 1. There's a very interesting comment here, 1 John, now, not the Gospel of John, 1 John 2, verse 1. I'm writing this to you, my children, so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have someone who pleads with the Father on our behalf, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. What do you suppose the word pleads comes from? Parakletos. Oh. Yeah. So Jesus is called a parakletos also. So that is, is that the... you. Is that verse translated um, in a strange way, the pleading? As we've said well, many times that yes. no one needs to plead with God for us. Yes, yes. well, Is we... Is a plead? Should it be help? Well, he doesn't need to help God. He needs to help us. Yeah, what but I mean... Yeah. <coughs> what he's trying to do is uh, bring us into harmony. Yeah. That, that's the... Well, it's a continuing what is called at one at uh, Some people at will say atonement, but that's... Uh, there was an at, at one moment that came about at the time of uh, the crucifixion, but the at, at one moment process is, continues up all yes. uh, forever. Mm -hmm. 
You mean we're it's not part of the teaching. We're not immediately at one minute when we get baptized. No, no. Well, but it's it, we're pointed in the right direction, per, hopefully. But for we're trying to learn about the infinite. The infinite is trying to communicate to us. That's mm -hmm. why I perceive it. Yeah. And so the more we l learn, the more we are, get to know. Well, if Jesus was also Parakletos, what does that teach us? Think about it. You know that you quoted there, uh, First John two uh, one. Uh -huh. It said we have one who pleads with the Father. Huh? RSV says advocate, yeah. but they're all on our side. Yeah, they're, they're not well, the the uh, Son or the Holy Spirit is not pleading to the Father. Hey, uh, you know, listen up. No, they're, they're both on our side, uh, trying to communicate to us. Yeah. That's and why I like it. We were going to come to that a little bit later. So thank you for mentioning it. Romans eight just makes it very very clear that all three members of the Godhead are on our side. They're probably pleading for us to come to God exactly. rather than for God to come exactly. to us. Exactly. Well, to restore the relationship. I think also we are supposed to be, you could say, paracletus to our fellow neighbors. Yeah. It's the whole, it comes right on down. Well, I think what we should learn from this verse is that the Holy Spirit wants to do for us in the 21st century exactly what Jesus tried to do for his disciples in the first century. I think, that, I think that's what we're supposed to learn from this. Well, one, one of the reasons why there's confusion when we talk about the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit works at a number of different levels. And we need to look at those levels. Um, and these are my words, except that I have put some verses in here to back up what I have to say. So you might have heard it, I don't know if you've ever heard it like this, but you might have heard it in some different context. Number one, I'm going to stop from the most basic, the most simple, right up through. He sustains our physical lives. Without him, our hearts would not keep beating, and we could not breathe. I mean, let's be very clear. We, our lives continue because the Holy Spirit gives us the, the divine power to keep. He's the one who makes the laws of physics work. Two, he constantly seeks to draw us or woo us to God. And by the way, that first section, if you want to read about that, Acts 17, verses 25 and 28. And this, this one, the second one, he draws or woos us. It talks about the Father and the Son doing this, but you know the Holy Spirit does the same thing. John 6, 44 and 12, 32. Then third, he convicts and converts those who are willing to listen to him. And this is the way he brings people into the fellowship, into the, to become a believer of God and to associate with God. And that's lots of verses, John 3, 5 to 8, 14, 6 and 7, 15, 26, 16, 13, and 18. And if you want all this stuff in a form that you can use in your own class, our, our handouts are available, the same things we use here, are available on our website anytime. It's uh, there on your screen, theox, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. You had a text on there, uh, Acts 17, 25. Yeah. Uh, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, yeah. since he himself gives to all, all men life and breath and everything. Yeah. Is God in need of anything? No. God doesn't need anything. But what does he want? What's best for us? Mm -hmm. I mean, well, it's he, totally other centered. And he wants our love and respect. But he doesn't need it. No. no. He doesn't okay? need it. He, God doesn't need to be praised. He doesn't need to be told he's great, even one time a day, let alone five times a day. Mm -hmm. He just wants us. We, we need to have the right attitude, yeah. but he is, God is in need of nothing. So he has us do it. For our benefit. For our benefit. Yeah. Oh. Number four, he produces <coughs> spiritual fruit in the lives of those who cooperate with him. That's, of course, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And he gives them spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 to 11, 28 and 29. Romans 12, 6 to 8, and Ephesians 4, 7 through 16, so they can spread the gospel to others. So he sustains our physical lives. He draws us, he woos us, he convicts and he converts. And now he's doing what? He gives us gifts for what purpose? Spiritual. To spread, to give us the power to spread the gospel to other people. And then yeah. Could you list a few spiritual gifts he gives us and or spiritual yeah. fruit we're supposed to have and spiritual gifts he gives us? Well, yeah, we can look at all those. That's very easy. Galatians 5.22, the Spirit produces, this is the fruit of the Spirit, love, 
joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and self-control. Now, I'm reading from my favorite version, which is the Good News Bible, prepared by the American Bible Society, but the King James or any other will have something similar to that. Um, and that's, the that's, gifts... See, that's the fruit that's supposed to be hanging from our bodies. Okay. Yes, well, we're supposed to be producing that producing. In, in our lives. Okay. I think you could probably enlarge on it, too. Some people oh, yeah. like good ministers. Think of the people that are very quick to pick up languages and what oh, went into the sure. translation of the Bible as we know it. Even today, there's new translations. Yep. I mean, they're all gifts. gifts so look at Romans, Romans chapter 12, just one place, six, verses 6 to 8, that talks about the gifts. So we are to use our different gifts in accordance with the grace that God has given us. If our gift is to speak God's message, that's one gift, we should do it according to the faith that we have. If it is to serve, we should serve. If it is to teach, we should teach. If it is to encourage others, we should do so. Whoever shares with others should do it generously. Whoever has authority should work hard. Whoever shows kindness to others should do it cheerfully. So there's just an example. In other places we say some are apostles, some are prophets, some are you know, teachers and pre uh, pastors and teachers and so forth. The, the wording isn't always the same, but... That's, those are gifts. Those um, are gifts. They come from the fruit. Okay. Yes. Well, the, we get the fruit and we get the gifts. Mm -hmm. Those are both just outright gift, and they are given for what purpose? Spread the word. So we can spread the word. And then in verse 5, which is, of course, a sort of overall thing, his most important role has been to inspire prophets and apostles to give us the scriptures. So when you pick up your Bible, you have in your hand the work of the Holy Spirit. Think about that. When you pick up your Bible, you are, you've, you've, you've taken a handful of the Holy Spirit right there. You better open it and start reading because it's, yeah. <laughs> you don't get it by osmosis. No, not by <laughs> osmosis. You've got you to open it and you've got to read it and you've got to ask Him to help you understand it. Absolutely. And, and the understanding that you gain, that's the work of the Holy Spirit too. You've Absolutely. Actually, in a very personal, intimate way, in a way nobody else has experienced it you're experiencing the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Mm -hmm. Well, what should we or can we say about the nature of the Holy Spirit? You know, people seem to have a problem. Does he have a body? Does he have eyes and ears and nose like we do? What is, or is, is he just some kind of essence? Ellen White wrote, the nature of the Holy Spirit is a mystery. For human beings, it's a mystery. Men cannot explain it because the Lord has not revealed it to them. Regarding such mysteries which are too deep for human understanding, silence is golden. That's from Acts of the Apostles, page 52. Okay, is that complicated for us to understand? She basically said, God has not chosen to tell us the nature of the Holy Spirit. So, what do, what do you mean by the nature of the Holy Spirit? Well, it means, does he, it is, can you pinch him? Does he, you know, does he have a body like you and me? Now, he obviously can make himself appear like a human being. I'm sure he's capable of doing that. But what is his basic nature? Is he, is he omnipresent, as we say? Is he omnipotent? Those kinds of things. You can, you can, you can go on ad nauseum. So, arguing about that with some so people. So are you saying that uh, he might not be omnipresent because we haven't been told of that? No, I think we, we, can, we can know what we have been told. Uh, David says he was there in the womb when, when his mother conceived him, when the Holy Spirit was there. Um, so, and of course we know that Jesus so was what, born what, because Mary helped, mm -hmm. he, he, he brought, you know, I don't, at what point, do whatever, and how, how it worked, we don't have any idea, but you know, he came upon Mary, and she gave birth to Jesus. Uh, so what's been proposed about the nature of the Holy Spirit that we really don't know anything about, so we need to stay away from it. Well, her. I've told you about just about everything we know. Well, you know, in the Garden of Eden, God told Eve, don't touch that fruit because it's not good for you. And so the Holy Spirit, maybe we just cannot understand and if God tried to tell us, we would pervert it in some way. Yeah. And I think we should trust God in the Garden of Eden. He was doing the best for Adam and Eve. And I think we should trust God and we know what we need to know about the Holy Spirit. And um, other than that, 
God chose what was best for us. And yeah. I think we're to trust and obey like Eve didn't. So I, I want to ask, uh, you were going over these, this list here a moment ago. He sustains our physical lives. He constantly seeks to draw us and us. He convicts and converts and so forth. So if this is what I know. This is what this Holy Spirit does. And we know what Jesus does, I guess. What? I thought God the Father did some of this. So if well, the Holy Spirit is doing do this, what, what is the God the Father doing? They all, I mean, we talked about the God the, God the Father two weeks ago. But yeah, I mean, they're, they're not saying, okay, you, only you can do this and only you can do that and only I can do this. No, they work together. They're a family. They, they have one consummate goal, and that's to, for the whole universe to understand them, especially right now those of us here on this earth who are so confused. They have a they they have a the same goal, but they have they play different roles. Yeah, Not exactly. that their roles couldn't be interchangeable. But the idea of a father, you have the idea of authority and strength and so forth and order, and the son, you have compassion, graciousness, and and feeling. And then the spirit works quietly behind, without, you know. He's got a whole universe to run. Yeah, it's it's a, a communication. So if 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 Jesus came to reveal. God in a uh, in a particular way is the Holy Spirit here to reveal in a way that Jesus hasn't revealed God to us well in a sense yes because the Holy Spirit works with the records that Jesus left behind yeah. and we have we have more truth available to us than any group that has ever existed in the history of the world I mean look at all and, and readily available I mean I've got I've got like 3,500 books in this little tiny computer here. Commentaries and Bibles and all kinds of different languages. I mean, what would Ellen White have done with this? What would Jesus have done with a thing like this? What would Paul have done with a thing like this? They would have, it would have blown their minds, you know? You know, I think we should see what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit. The Holy, Jesus called the Holy Spirit a comforter. Yes. We have our own personal shrink that we can go to and pray to and who will translate our, par our prayers. Doesn't the Holy Spirit translate the prayers? Yeah. Well, Ella and White said in one other place, in a famous place, she was giving a, a discourse to the students at Avondale College and part of that she said, the Holy Spirit, who is as much a person as God is a person, is walking through these grounds. So, how would you like to interpret that, Jay? Um, how would I like to interpret it? Well, I think it's, I don't need to interpret it. It's just fine. I like it. I yeah. know how I would interpret it. <laughs> I, I, I'd like to add a little bit to this. Having been a student in that area and yeah. being a, lived in that area, yeah. I don't doubt it for an instant. If you have the time and ever go there, it looks, you think, oh, this it's just ordinary up-to-date place, but you get out behind a little bit in some of the bush around it and behind on the mountains. That was very heavily timbered country. Yes. And all they had was God, no money, and picks and shovels, literally. And you yep. see it today, it's almost got governmental university status, is very close. I mean, it's advanced tremendously. All, mm -hmm. and she was one of the leading lights. Oh, absolutely. The leading light to get it going. Yeah. I mean, when you stop and think about, and uh, you know, I, I probably say too much about Ellen White. Maybe I shouldn't say so much, but I mean, here's a, a third grade, a third grade graduate who started a whole bunch of universities. I mean, <laughs> how does that work? Everything. Yeah, right. and publishing houses and churches, and I mean, just unbelievable. And many of them, she started with her own money, yes. including the one where we are here at Loma Linda. You know, she sent the like the first money and say, yeah, buy that place. <laughs> when the general yeah, conference was saying, don't buy it. Exactly. <laughs> so the Holy Spirit is not just some kind of influence or disembodied power. Consider the following passages that talk about the personality of the Holy Spirit, okay? The personality of the Holy Spirit. He teaches us and brings things to our remembrance, John 14, 26. He testifies of Jesus, John 15, 26. We already read that. He convicts the world, John 16, 8. His great hope is to guide us into all truth, John 16, 13. Later, New Testament writers made it clear that the Holy Spirit has the essential characteristics of a person, 
What are those characteristics? He has a will, 1 Corinthians 12, 11. He has intelligence, Acts 15, 28, and Romans 8, 26, and 27. And emotions, Romans, Romans 15, 30, Ephesians 1, 13, and 4, 30. It makes him sad when we turn away from him. We can grieve the Holy Spirit, yeah, the Bible says. Exactly. If we invite him in, the Holy Spirit will dwell in our hearts, Romans 8, 9 transform our lives, Titus 3, 5, and produce the spirit, fruits of the Spirit in our characters, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. I mean, you know, what more could we ask for? And how many ways is the Spirit just like Jesus? Well, He's divine. Both of them are divine. They both have the same goals in mind for us. What's their goal for us? They want us to be in heaven, right, as soon as possible. He's able to foretell the future far in advance, John 16, 13, which only God can do, Isaiah 46, 9 through 11. Prophets in the Old Testament were inspired by the Spirit, Psalms 110, verse 1. You know, I think that's something we don't think about. The Holy Spirit knows the future, mm -hmm. and that's how He inspires the prophets. I hadn't thought of the Holy Spirit knowing the future. Absolutely. Well, if that's not enough, while He was here on this earth, in cooperation with the Father and the Holy Spirit, Jesus planned every day and every activity. If you wonder what he was doing in those whole nights of prayer, for example, look, look at Luke 6, 12. Sometimes we overlook this verse. At that time, Jesus went up a hill to pray and spent the whole night there praying to God. Now, why did he do that? And important things to come, important decisions to make. Like what? Like choosing the twelve disciples. The very next morning he said, okay, now the time has come for me to choose my disciples. They spent the night in a, in a, in a nominating committee. He needed all the help he could get the whole time he was on earth. And us? Even well, we more. do, but we don't <laughs> go for it, do we, quite often. Wouldn't that be interesting to know his short list and who made it and who didn't? Yeah, exactly. Oh, some, uh, it wasn't too long ago somebody explained that uh, Jesus inspired the prophets, Jesus and the Holy Spirit, so that when Jesus came as a baby and, and developed through as, as a young man, he had something to learn from. Yeah, exactly. I don't know why it took me so long to figure that out, but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jesus was anointed by the Spirit at his baptism. What's, um, what does the word uh, Christ or Messiah mean? Anointed, anointed. One. The anointed one. So who is the one who anointed Jesus at his baptism? The Holy, Spirit. the Holy Spirit. And who else was present at that time? God the Father was. How do you know that? He spoke, he spoke to them. He spoke. So remember, at the baptism, as Jesus is coming up out of the water, the Holy Spirit descends like a dove. And who speaks? The Father speaks. How many were there? All three members of the Godhead were there at the baptism. That was his anointing. That was his, you know, say, okay, go. It's time for the marathon. And he had the name Joshua, right? Yeshua. Yeshua, yeah. which means healer. Jesus saves. Yeah, basically. Well, uh, Exodus yeah. fifteen twenty six. I am your healer. Yeah. I'll restore you. Yeah. So this idea of sin being a disease and God can heal it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, why is the Holy Spirit often uh, depicted as a dove? Any idea? That Doves? Be because a dove came down? But partly. Uh, um, I think God wants us to think. I mean, nobody thinks of the go a dove as, a, as some kind of a dangerous animal. It's peaceful. Not a, not a predator. It, it's not a predator. It's peaceful. It's quiet. It, it comes down. It settles quietly. Okay. Um, and so uh, I think that was part of the reason, at least. Well, look at all going on here. He, um, Jesus was anointed by the Spirit at his baptism, Matthew 3, 16 and 17. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, Luke 4, 1. And after his temptations, he returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, Luke 4, 14. I mean, the Spirit was there every step of the way. And his miracles were performed through the power of the Holy Spirit, Matthew 12, 28. He didn't perform those miracles by his own power. He used whose power? The Holy Spirit's power to perform those miracles, just the way they had planned the night before. 
Do you think the Holy Spirit was suffering with Jesus in the wilderness for those absolutely, 40 days? Absolutely, absolutely. And the Father. And they were very much suffering uh, on Calvary, both of them, in addition to Jesus. Surely the fact that Jesus performed all of these mighty works by the power of the Spirit proves that the Spirit is divine. Why do we say that? Would someone who had the incredible job to do that Jesus had, would he ask for ordinary human help? Or does he need divine help? Oh, both for that matter. <laughs> he asked us to help him. Yeah. One more evidence of his divinity is in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Who, who, who is who's supposed to guide us to make us active agents for God? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are to be the active agents as we go to all peoples, teaching them and baptizing them. Remember, do we need to read that? Maybe we should. Some people maybe have forgotten. Go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of who? Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and I will be with you always to the end of the age. So what do you think the Holy Spirit's doing in that process? Actively. Teaching us to do that, right? Teaching us to obey and helping us uh, to, um, helping us to be able to obey. Sure, and to, te and to teach others, to baptize them, to direct them, yeah. Well, you know, you really can't teach someone you, something you don't know yourself. So right. first job is ourselves. Now there's a verse about the Holy Spirit that really confuses people and really they really struggle with it. It's found in Matthew 12, verses 31 and 32. So I'm going to read it from you, to you from my Good News Bible. And so I tell you that people can be forgiven any sin and any evil thing they say, but whoever says evil things against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who says something against the Son of Man can be forgiven, but whoever says something against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven now or ever. Boy, that sounds pretty scary, yeah, right? Yeah, that's very scary. Plain enough. Sounds arbitrary. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. what, what, what's he trying to tell us there? Some people have labeled that the unpardonable sin. Is that a good name? Yeah. It's kind of thus far no further, isn't it? Yeah. I hope you're going to tell us what that paragraph means. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well let's think about this. Is that, is, that, is that something that happens at a particular time? Like at the end of the world? Or okay, I'm, that happen? Well, hold on. Let's, 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 in the you're, next five minutes. You're a re really good question. Let's see if we can work our way through it. It takes time. What's, what's the, if you were to summarize the work of the Father, what would you say he does? Could you do that in a few words? I'd say creates. Okay. I was going to say the overseer. He's the CEO yeah. of the universe, mm -hmm. really. I mean, that, that he operates in that kind of, you know, to use a human term for something, for lack of something better, he's sort of in charge of everything. Okay, what's Jesus do? He's a teacher. Teacher. He's the one who specifically, his role is to relate to God's children, to relate to God's creatures, the ones that God has created. He was an angel to the angels. He, is a, he was a human to human beings, and he still does that same kind of work, although he may not be so visible now. He still does that same work. He is the member of the Godhead who, you know, sits down beside you and is, you know, is like you're talking to another human being or another angel for that matter. So he's the he, one that we... He moves through God's creation. Yes. Yeah. So what does that leave for the Holy Spirit to do? Inspire. Inspire the Bible, for example, absolutely. Inspire people. We already gave you a list of five things that we got forgotten already. Yeah. I would say he's active in pretty well all facets of our lives. Yes. I mean, he keeps us alive. Everywhere, everybody. He keeps us alive. He woos us. That means he tries to draw us to become a lot more like Jesus. He convicts and converts those who are willing to read and study and say, yes, I know what I should do. Okay, God, help me. That's conviction. That's conversion. Okay. Then he gifts us and he, you know, the gifts are not just 
uh, uh, the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, etc. But also he gives us the gifts of to be apostles, to be prophets, to be, you know, pastors, teachers, etc. All the things we read a little bit ago. And then, of course, his primary gift is Scripture. the Scriptures. Is the Holy Spirit to keep us alive, to fit us for heaven so that we can be citizens of heaven? Mm -hmm. Now, given all those things that the Holy Spirit does, if you say, Holy Spirit, I don't want anything to do with you, what are you saying? There are people who say that. If you cut yourself off from life, you don't want to be wooed by the Spirit. You don't want to have anything to do with Him. You certainly don't want to be converted. You don't want any of His gifts. And you certainly don't want the Bible. What do you have left? Well, you don't want in His heaven. You want in a heaven that maybe doesn't exist. You know, there are stories of people who decided they were going to do that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, maybe a classic example on a smaller scale was somebody who who reads the Bible with an intent to disprove the Bible, yeah. and then all of a sudden they become converted. Yeah. There are stories of people who have tried to run from God in this mm -hmm. kind of a way and, and uh, ran right into it. Yeah. Well, yeah. what happens if you say no to the Holy Spirit? I well, that's, that's what we're saying here. If you, God says, okay, the work of the Holy Spirit is to grab onto us and help us to wake up and come to God. Now, if you say, I don't want anything to do with that, you're, you're just saying, God, get lost. I don't want anything to do with you. Are there other texts that would indicate that it takes a little longer than just once? This, I was oh, yeah. always raised with that impression. You can, you can ultimately grieve the Spirit, but it's not necessarily right this second. It no, takes no. time, but sooner or later, if you keep it up, it's if, like if, God said before, he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. Same deal with the Spirit. Holy Spirit. Well, but w what if your parents threw you out the first time you said no? <laughs> it's, it's, it's the same thing. You know, you go, you go through the terrible twos, and what do they say every five seconds? No, no, no. no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, our parents don't throw us out because we disagree with them. But God says that's dangerous because each day that goes by, and if we keep saying no, we may end up on our deathbed mm -hmm. and we may actually lose our mind yeah. to make the decision to say yes. And, and we, we were going to say yes in the future and the future never came. We yeah. missed our opportunity. Well, it turns out if you go back and look at the verse in Matthew 12, Mark, the context more carefully, the people that Jesus was responding to were people who claimed that what he was doing, the miracles he was performing, there they are right in front of them. Jesus is performing miracles and they're attributing those miracles to Beelzebub. the devil, the yeah. devil, Beelzebub. They're claiming that God's miraculous power is for straight from the devil. What do you do to someone like that? What do you say to them? Well, I think he said it. Well, that's a little tricky because in the end days, the devil is supposed to be coming and doing miracles. And what if we say those miracles are not God's. But I, I think it also points out we're individually going to be judged on the chances that we've been given. Mm -hmm. And the Pharisees, that's what he was getting, Christ was getting at right there. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I, well, <coughs> I, my, well, I don't want to be in confessional here, but <laughs> my, my impression that most of us have had lots and lots, a whole lot more opportunities than we ever took advantage of. Oh, yes. yes, of course. But I, of course. what I was getting at is the likes of us here versus a tribesman in the highlands of New Guinea and Mount Hagen. Yeah. yeah. There's a whole different ball game. Yeah. Can you tell us again what it is to grieve, to, to, what was it, to... Uh, grieve away the Holy Spirit? Yeah, yeah. Basically, it's if, if you keep saying no, 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 and you really mean it, I don't want to have anything to do with you, God will finally say, well, there's a verse in the Bible, maybe we should just look at it. It's found in the little book of Hosea. Um, let you go. Yeah, He'll Hosea 4, choice. verse 7. Eventually, let God will honor your choice and let you go. They've been around a lot longer than we ever can imagine. They've got to be a fairly good judge of character one way or another. Hosea 4.17, the people of Israel are under the spell of idols. Let them go their own way. I mean, what can God do? 
let them go their own way. And we don't know after how many no's of ours God will say, let her go her own way. Well, in this case, we know that God had worked with these people for about 500 years. Is that long enough? Long enough for one life. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, consider some of these things that we've been told about the work of the Holy Spirit if we are willing to cooperate with Him. Now, these are the things that the Holy Spirit is willing to do for us. He's waiting, okay? He, and this, is, uh, I'm, this first quotation is from Desire of Ages, page 172, paragraph 1. He who is trying to reach heaven by his own works is in keeping the law is attempting an impossibility. We need to recognize that first. We don't have the option of saying, well, Holy Spirit, I don't need you. I can do this on my own. Is it, how, how, how possible is that? Not at all. Completely impossible. There is no safety for one who has merely a legal religion. There's a lot of people who need to read that and understand what it says. There's no safety for one who has merely a legal religion, a form of godliness. The Christian's life is not a modification or improvement of the old, but a transformation of nature. There's death to self and sin and a new life altogether. This change can be brought about only by the effectual working of the Holy Spirit. And found it's not only Desire of Ages 172, but a number of other places. So what's the, what is the work of the Holy Spirit in, in, this, in this context? Is, is that a long-term process, or is that a... <clears throat> now long, you're under the water, and now you're out of the water. How long does it take for a butterfly to be transformed in... I mean, to caterpillar to be transformed into a butterfly? Well, I don't know. A few days. Three, three quarters of his life. <laughs> okay. So the Holy Spirit keeps working. Transforms us, and we cannot transform ourselves no matter how hard we try right. without the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Now, let me add something more. Again, I think from the writings of Ellen White, or it's being suggested anyway. The Holy Spirit doesn't plan to stop when we get to heaven. This is just a bare beginning. He's going to continue to work with us and to develop our characters and in our, our brains, etc., for the rest of eternity. So this so is just this is just a warm up. I don't have to be perfect. No, when, you don't have to be perfect. When when all these cataclysms come and <laughs> and Jesus comes and takes us all back to heaven, I I've got all eternity to work on my character. Is that what you're saying here? Well, yes, but we have to reach a certain point to, to avoid being completely deceived by the devil mm -hmm. when he shows up. You have to get a C grade or a B grade, <laughs> or what do you have to Some, get? There? Somewhere up to C minus. <laughs> you got to lay some groundwork somewhere. Let's put it that way. Well, Jay, it, with your students, you can look at your A students and you can look at your D students and you can go, I know my D student can do it if we give him a little more time and encourage him. Isn't this what the Holy Spirit is doing with us? Looking forward and going, I know this person can do this. So is that what this millennium, these thousand years are for? Are they going to finally get us all whipped into shape? It, that's a workshop. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, what about this? I mean, if you want to talk about where we're going, what about this one? This is Desire of Ages, page 664, paragraph 4. Jesus revealed no qualities and exercised no powers. Now, what kind of powers did Jesus exercise? Healing powers. Healing raising the raising dead. From the dead yeah. He healed people. Thousands. He cleansed the lepers. He raised people from the dead. Okay? Fed Jesus. Thousands. Huh? He fed thousands. Fed thousands. He calmed he, the storm. He revealed no qualities and exercised no powers that men may not have through faith in him. So we could do all that. that it's perfect. For, what? For forgiving sins. That goes for forgiving sins. We're going to talk about that. Well, Peter told that they could go out and forgive sins. Yeah. Heal and forgive sins. And yeah. In his, in his, <coughs> repent. He told him repent. Occasionally I do that for some of my students. Good. Forgive their sins. <laughs> 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 okay. I'm not sure it's forgiveness. Probably just give up. Well, his perfect humanity 
is that which all his followers may possess if they will be in subjection to God as he was. I think that's a pretty, pretty big if, but it's possible. So what the well, Holy Spirit says, okay, how much, do you want, how much do you want to be like Jesus? I'm here. What are you waiting for? Well, that's a work of not only a lifetime, we're going to be working on that throughout eternity, right? Exactly. It'll be de a delightful challenge for the rest of eternity. And then we come to this one found in Desire of Ages 671. Boy, that's a lot of character building. Work in, de forever. in describing to his disciples the office work of the Holy Spirit. Now, we've been talking about what the Holy Spirit does. That's what we're trying to talk about here. So Jesus says, let me tell you what the Holy Spirit does. This is his office work. Okay. Jesus sought to inspire them with the joy and hope that inspired his own heart. So what is he saying? Just as the Holy Spirit worked with me and sustained me and kept me from falling into despair and all that kind of stuff, the one who gave me joy and courage to, to start out again every morning, he's available to you. He rejoiced because of the abundant help he had provided for his church. He, he rejoices because he knows that this help is available to us. The Holy Spirit was the highest of all gifts that he could solicit from his Father for the exaltation of his people. His, let's see, what, what is the very best gift I can pro possibly give to my church? Do you think Jesus asked the Holy Spirit if the Holy Spirit would be that gift, or do you think the Holy Spirit volunteered and said, Jesus? Jesus, Holy Spirit's been waiting for as long as we've been around. In, in a sense, it's, it's made to sound so easy. But that being said, one wonders why so many books about prayer have been written. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's obviously not quite as easy as some people think. I, I don't know. I've pondered this a lot. The Spirit was to be given as a, continuing from Ellen White, the Spirit was to be given as a regenerating agent. And without this, the sacrifice of Christ would have been of no avail. Now, is this a, a unique relationship in uh, all of the universe? Between who and who? Well, we Adventists generally believe that we're not the only ones uh, here in this cosmos. Yeah. So, I mean, from the description that you're, 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 you're describing here, it sounds like uh, we're kind of getting a special treatment. So we're, it, we're the only rebels. Right now, God's working on us. So this unique relationship between us and the Holy Spirit that's going to go on for all these other beings in the universe, are they going to have to be developing character or are they all sure. done? No, they're, they're working on it too. The power of evil had been strengthening for centuries, and the submission of man to the satanic capti captivity was amazing. Of course, it's talking about the time when Jesus was here on this earth. Sin could be resisted and overcome only. What does only mean? Only. There's no other way, right? The sin could be resisted and overcome only to the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, who would come with no modified energy, but in the fullness of divine power. Would you like to have all of God's power to help you overcome sin? You know, I really respect the Holy Spirit uh, volunteers to get his hands dirty with us. Here's this perfect, perfect, righteous being and this righteous being will go into the most horrible sinful when these girls are getting kidnapped when all this horrible stuff and the holy spirit is right there working with the victim and experiencing things that only us brought to the godhead i mean the godhead did not have to experience all this sin before us and i just think the holy spirit is just the strongest person to, and, and 
um, he, he, he will get his hands dirty to come and yeah. save us. And not every uh, person who's in a high position will work with the peasants, like, That's right. so to speak. Through this, so, oh, so, so now this, if, if all of this uh, power is available to me to mm -hmm. accomplish all this magnificent stuff, um, you know, that, that's, uh, if, I, if I seem to be manifesting in that in my life, I could kind of have quite a guilt trip. But if all of that is available, mm -hmm. then why did Paul say in his very famous statement, I keep doing everything I try to do right, it, it, mm -hmm. it, it turns out wrong and, and, and so on and so forth. So it's like it, Romans 7 to me. So am I, I mean, am I supposed to really worry that I'm not getting, if all this power is available, it sounds like, well, I, I ought to be able to, um, th there shouldn't be a time when Jesus should have to say for me, forgive them for, because he doesn't know what he's doing. Well, who else is working full steam ahead? The devil. The devil. We've got two competing well, but I've got supernatural all this, forces. I've got all this power available to me from the whole That's thing. right. I worry about the devil. Did Jesus worry about the devil? Yes. He did. He almost died worrying about the devil. I think out in the wilderness of temptation. Paul also pointed out indirectly, we've got to get up and keep trying. Through the Spirit, I'm reading on, through the Spirit, the believer becomes a partaker of the divine nature. Christ has given His Spirit as a divine power to overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil and to impress His own character upon His church. I mean, you know. Is that today? Or is that, that is today. Down, down the line. We cannot use the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is to use us. Through the Spirit, God works in His people to will and to do of His good pleasure. But many will not submit to this. They want to manage themselves. This is why they do not receive the heavenly gift. Only to those who wait humbly upon God, who watch for His guidance and grace, is the Spirit given. The power of God awaits their demand and reception. This promised blessing, claimed by faith, brings all other blessings in its train. It is given according to the riches of the grace of Christ, and He is ready to supply every soul according to the capacity to receive. And one more, the very image of God is to be reproduced in humanity. The honor of God, the honor of Christ, is involved in the perfection of the character of His people. Desire pages 671, paragraph 3. Well, as we've already raised the question, Changes of that kind of magnitude could never happen overnight. There's no once saved, always saved kind of relationship. If we allow the Holy Spirit to come into our lives and if we renew that commitment every day, He will dwell with us forever. John 14, 16. All of us are influenced by one Spirit or another. Jesus Himself was filled with the Holy Spirit, Luke 4, 1. Daily He received a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit, Christ's obvious lessons, 139. I mean, I don't know how many times in many ways we need to say this. So how do we receive the Holy Spirit? Our Father God is more than willing to give the Holy Spirit to all those who honestly ask for Him. What is the ultimate goal of the Spirit's relationship with His human associates? Read Acts 1, verses 48. Every one of us is supposed to be a daily witness for Jesus. So what's the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Acts 1, Matthew 3, John 1. Ephesians 5, I mean, we could go on. Why do you think the Holy Spirit takes such a subordinate, humble role? Haven't we seen that the Holy Spirit has a very important work to be done, to do? There are some Pentecostal Christians, Christian groups, who believe that one does not have the Spirit, and in fact, she or he is not even a Christian unless she or he has spoken in tongues. So maybe that's what we need to do to have the work of the Holy Spirit. What do you mean tongues? Well, it's called glossolalia. If you want to know a technical term, it means you go to church and you, you get into this spiritual high and you speak supposedly other speak languages. A language that's not ever spoken here on earth. Yeah. We believe that it is clearly taught in scriptures and the writings of Ellen White that a latter rain is coming. In fact, in power and extent, it will far exceed the former rain at the time of the Pentecost. 
And who will be the power behind the latter rain? Of course, it will be the Holy Spirit. Today, what keeps the Holy, what keeps the Holy Spirit from being active in the power of the latter rain? In what ways is the work of the Holy Spirit similar to, and in what ways is it different from the work of what Jesus did? Now, Jesus was here present. They could see him. They could touch him. They could feel him. Holy Spirit's not like that. The devil loves to use force. We know that. And God never uses it. Desire of ages 22. Jesus didn't. The Holy Spirit doesn't. As we've seen in recent news reports, the wind can have devastating effects. It is very powerful. The wind... The word for spirit in the Bible is the same as the word for breath and wind. Think of all the things that are accomplished by the wind. What are the characteristics of the wind? In what ways do those represent the characteristics of the spirit? I wish we had time to sit down and discuss all those things, but just in closing, although our current investigation focuses on Christ's teachings regarding the Holy Spirit, no explanation would be complete without understanding the presentation of the Holy Spirit from the Old Testament onward. Genesis 1, 1 to 3 indicates that God's Spirit participated in creation. He equipped people for specific undertakings. One, Bible writing, 1 Peter 1, 10 and 11. Tabernacle construction, Exodus 31, 3. Leadership, Othniel, Jephthah, David. See Judges 3, 10, 11, 29, 1 Samuel 16, 13. And four, prophetic utterance, Luke 1, 15, 40, 41, 67, and 1 Samuel 10, 9 through 13. Furthermore, the Holy Spirit oversaw and empowered Christ's earthly ministry. Jesus was conceived by the Spirit, Luke 1.35, Matthew 1.20. Jesus was likewise anointed uh, uh, with the Holy Spirit in lots of verses. The Holy Spirit guided Jesus' earthly movements and D, even facilitated Christ's sacrificial offering. Finally, Jesus was resurrected by God's Spirit. This lesson has tried to focus on Christ's teachings about the Holy Spirit, but Jesus is not physically present on our earth at the present time. So in the physical absence of Jesus, God speaks through his divine spokesperson, the Holy Spirit, and I don't have time to read all these things that he does. Helps us to resist sin, to learn the truth. Uh, he, he, he inscribes his divine truth on the hearts of believers. Finally, the Holy Spirit distributes spiritual gifts to believers for accomplishing Christ's mission. Are we ready for the Holy Spirit to be poured out in latter rain power? What can we do to get ready? Thank you.